G'day friends, welcome to today's video, a very quick and impromptu video today. Basically, I added some uh, new to me half pans in this Daniel Smith watercolor palette that I've created. And uh, this is a 48 tin, 48 color tin. I'll leave a link to this down below, I got it on Amazon. This is my old swatch card, a lot of memories with that. <laughs> I've added in a full extra row, so uh, you know, these three rows has to become four, and being ultra like I am, I've printed up a new one. Uh, so it's all nice and neat. And I'm going to swatch everything out today, give you a bit of a chat as to uh, what my favorite colors might be and why I like, like certain things and you know, et cetera, et cetera, I guess. <laughs> if, uh, if you're wondering how I came into possession of such lovely watercolors, I have only ever bought this row right here up until the Aussie red gold. Um, everything else was gifted to me. So a big thank you again to uh, the lovely people that were so generous enough to share their Daniel Smith watercolors with me. I know these can be expensive. The only ones I ever bought in a tube were Kyanite Genuine, Payne's Blue Grey and Moon Glow um, because these are my, you know, these are my full on faves. I, I would love to buy everything in a tube, let's be real, but I do love to use them from the half pans and just re-wet them. This, you know, you need a palette for it. Become a, it's a little more cumbersome, a process to use them from the tube, but I do like to refill with these if I know I love the color. So my moon glow is almost gone. Um, maybe you might have to buy another one of those. I don't know. <laughs> I love that it's called Claire de Lune in French. So pretty. Um, but these are, you know, artist grade watercolor paints. They are absolutely stunning and I have been gifted a lot of these. Um, you can see this one here. Gigi has her name on one of them. There it is. <laughs> Thank you, Gigi. These are actually the end of her tubes here. Um, these aren't in the half pans, but I'll swatch those out today because I have access to them. And these are three half pans that don't fit. I have tried to squish them down in here, but I thought it's just going to get a little much. Um, I, I might just put these in another palette that I have off to the side because I do have a lot of um, designs by Rachel Beth palettes as well, but um, I might just end up putting some of these into one of these little palettes because I like to keep these color stories together. They're so perfect the way they are. So just leave those over there. I'm gonna swatch through them all. There is a wealth of information on the internet about watercolors. I couldn't possibly begin to tell you the half of it. So I'm gonna let you go figure that out if you wanna go and have a sleuth around the internet. The one thing I will say really helped me with choosing colors or um, or knowing what I might like in the future if I was ever going to buy a, a larger set or buy half pans um, is this Daniel Smith swatch card. I've actually kept using these. I even used one of these through Mermaid in my uh, journal. I um, You can get a lot out of one of these dots. Don't let it fool you. <laughs> um, some of them I have really, really loved and, uh, and it's just like super interesting to see how some of them work. Some of them I haven't been able to locate either. Um, I have been looking on the internet, like this iridescent scarab red is just crazy to me. And I love that. Either way, this is good for um, anyone looking to get into it and just want to, you know, something entry level. I feel like the dot chart is great for that. The interesting thing about it too is it explains to you all the color information as well. So this is really invaluable if you're looking to understand a bit about why these are expensive and why they work better than student grade and why you might need them. Now, the reason behind why anyone might need artist grade is if you're selling your work and most of it is based on the fact that it would be light fast. Um, light fastness basically means how long your uh, your the pigment in your paint will hold up to exposure to light. So it's basically saying whether it's archival or not, you know, how long is this painting going to last being displayed in an area where there's natural light being exposed to it? Because if you've ever driven past an old McDonald's, you'll know that the playground set looks pretty faded. <laughs> um, and that's because pigments, you know, they they react, they're chemicals, they react to light, just like our skin reacts to sunlight, just like, uh, you know, everything in the planet kind of reacts to sunlight. So it's only natural that a lot of these pigments, you know, are not going to stand the test of time if you expose them to light like crazy. A lot of the more genuine pi uh, mineral pigments will because um, let's face it, they've come from rocks and rocks have been out in the sunlight for trillions of years and they've just been fine. So <laughs> um, you'll find a lot of that, but um, you know, there are colors in here that you just like, if you were ever to sell a real piece and you wanted it to be archival or for it to last a long time, um, you, you know, opera pink is, it's just, it's rated a four, which is technically the fugitive pigment. Um, I believe it has something to do with the red dye that they use. It's a synthetic pigment. 
I just don't know. It's a little fluorescent, it's great. I know we're super attracted to these bright colors, but um, just something to note if you are selling artworks for a premium price, um, you know, light fastness and, and archival quality is kind of expected in that arena. For what we do for art journaling, for mixed media arts and crafts, I feel like it's really not essential. And I don't think any of us have been trying to sell our journal pages to national galleries yet. <laughs> um, but I would just encourage you to um, play around with this not so that you can look for, you know, something that'll make your journal last for a thousand years, but so you can see the different types of paints and how they perform. The one thing I love, love, love about watercolor is the granulation of it. I love the pooling, the blooming, and um, specifically the granulation of a lot of these mineral pigments or these um, split pigments, dual pigment type things. Like this green appetite genuine, I mean, that's just such a, a random effect that you can get from this cobalt green pale. Like, look at that color. The smalt, 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 <laughs> I'm going to apologize straight up. Some of these names, they will kill me. I just don't know what to say. Um, I'm going to try my absolute hardest. I, I'm still regretting that we're going to have to get to this at some point. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go for it. The, uh, the thing to look for in this is colors that stand out to you. Things that you won't be able to access in student grade or cheaper watercolors. Um, handmade watercolors are great too for the interesting uh, mixes you can get there. Designs by Rachel Beth has great watercolors if you can get your hands on them. But things like this Manhattan, this dual pigment kind of um, purple and uh, with a green gold. I don't know, I'm colorblind in that spectrum. <laughs> Irid I think it's green. Um, it's like an iridescent shift to it and you can see that bare undertone it is just beautiful and um, I, to me this this Manhattan reminded me of a Daniel Smith called um, duochrome cactus flower which I actually have now here this one was gifted to me as well so um, we're gonna swatch that out but it's actually super different um, I feel like in essence they're kind of the same thing this was a purple base with a bit of a shift to it but I think it might be a bit more of a blue shift than a green gold shift Either way, they're completely different, I've found in the end, but fun to note. Uh, handmade watercolors, watercolors are great for that because the artists that uh, make them, the people that create them, choose which pigments to put together. And essentially all of these are, are just pigments at the end of the day with binders. And uh, the difference between artist grade and student grade and introductory and expensive and artist and beginner and all that type of stuff um, is not just price. There's a lot that goes into it being completely different. And a lot of it has to do with the quality of the pigment and the amount of binder or filler that goes into it. So um, be a bit discerning with your research if you are looking to upgrade. My suggestion would be to start with the, the color chart to know where you want to start. Um, I prefer to use half pans, so these dried watercolors, and just to re-wet them as I go. I find it much easier to work like this than to, uh, you know, pour some of this into a palette and then keep using it from that. Um, I have never really done that. I've only ever really used them from the half pans, but everyone's gonna have a uh, personal preference and I encourage you to find what works for you. Um, which will only come through trial and error. So, uh, I would encourage you to start here, um, pick up on some of the colors that really stick out to you, that look unique, that look interesting, and uh, and pick some that you might want to try. I personally, I would buy half pans, and then if I ran out, I would buy a, a tube to refill it. I know it's not the most economical to buy a half pan, but some people will never need more than this. <laughs> um, let's be honest, I use these all the time and some of them I barely put a dent in and I use them a ton. Um, so I find that, uh, you know, one of these half pans might last you 12 years and, you know, at the end of that you're not going to be saying, oh, darn, I really wish I would have saved that 30 cents by getting the tube. Um, yes, sometimes, and you know what, sometimes like these tubes can be up to $30 depending on where you live. So to get a $6 half pan, uh, you know, and then to refill it once with this, uh, you know, refill it with a tube and then to replace it with a tube once you're out of it. I, I just, I think that seems more safe to me. It seems like it makes more sense, but obviously not the most economically sound thing to do. If you're actually making all of your decisions based on the dollar amount, then I guess just go straight for the tube. <laughs> uh, but then again, if you like to work in a half pan, you'll have to get some half pans and you'll have to buy a pallet. So figure it out for yourself. Either way, we're not here for that. We're here for this and uh, let's get Get to swatching. I'm gonna pull this out because it's a little easier for me to get to out of the 
tin. Okay, I've got two water glasses over here. One I'm gonna wash my brush into, and the other one I'm going to um, give it a second rinse into after I've uh, cleaned it, just because you really don't wanna be cross-contaminating the colors in, you know, when you're doing your swatches. It'll give you a very real representation of what the color looks like, and uh, just putting it into your dirty water and then putting it back in is going to kind of contaminate the swatch a little bit. And uh, like I said, please forgive me for how I butcher some of these names. Honestly, I mean, I know a lot of these are like natural mineral names, so it's not, you know, it's not any particular person's fault, but someone at some point in time named these. <laughs> <laughs> Even the pigments. So this is Kyanite Genuine. I love this because you can see the minerals in it and it's such a beautiful shade of blue. To get an orange pencil and Kyanite Genuine um, is, is heaven. So it's a little hard to re-wet, not gonna lie. When I do my swatches, I do like to put a lot of the pigment down and I, I like to um, also add some water back into it because I like to do a lot of those effects um, of pooling and blooming and I love all the granulation so I, I want to kind of simulate that in my swatch so that I know I, what I'm going to get out of it when I actually come to use it. I don't really want to flat wash because that's not how I'm going to use it. I know it's super um, picky but I try my best to do that. Ultimately we make these decisions with our eyes right so you want to give your eyes kind of the best understanding of what they're about to pick out for you. <laughs> Look at how I'm using this brush, like a monster. I thought I was gonna be really fancy about this, but it turns out I'm being just as rough as usual. <laughs> That's Moonglow, it has a really great mix of, um, sorry, I should be explaining it, red and blue and purple, and it kind of all separates when you add some water. This is Payne's Blue Gray. It's more blue than gray. One of the things I notice a lot of people um, struggle with when they're using watercolor and, and or always asking for help, I notice they don't use a lot of water. And um, as the name implies, <laughs> watercolor. You kind of got to use a lot of it to, um, to push a lot of these techniques that we like to use as mixed media artists, uh, which I believe a lot of that is um, texture and light washes and layering, that buildability that you can get. Um, through glazing, that transparency, the kind of light that you can get from within. Watercolors are just kind of magical like that. And a very, very um, kind of mess-free method of painting. I feel like they're the least effort when it comes to painting. You know, oils are a lot. <laughs> I can't even think about oils without being overwhelmed. Acrylic is a bit of a setup. You know, you've got, once, the, once they're dry, they, you can't move them. The gouache is kind of the same way, depending on which gouache you have, I guess, but Watercolor is just simple, quite relaxing actually. A nice way to color and render. The last color I did was Wisteria, which was one of the newer Daniel Smith colors last year. I love the color Wisteria. It is a beautiful purple. This is raw sienna light, I'll be completely honest. It looks 100% yellow to me. <laughs> so, uh, not the sienna that I usually think of, but I usually use the burnt sienna, so. You know, my eyes are just being biased for that. I'm going in with lavender. Going in, like I'm a makeup artist. <laughs> kind of, I mean makeup, beauty gurus do all these swatches, don't they? They all do all that controversial, like the finger swatches on the back of the wrist and they like doctor them and go over it seven times and say, this is just with one swipe. It's all an industry, it's all marketing at the end of the day. So always take it with a grain of salt, don't you? That's lavender. I want to love lavender more than I do. I do love it, I think it's beautiful, but I, for some reason in my head I'm always having a competition between lavender and wisteria, and it, wisteria just wins out. I'm more of a red-purple person than a blue-purple person, if that makes sense. <laughs> Rose Matter Permanent. It's kind of a really nice red-pink. Burnt Sienna. This is a really pretty color. I actually love this top row of colors in my palette. I think it builds such a fun story on its own. And I love the term color story. I don't know why. Quinacridone Lilac. That is, I mean, that is pretty. It's like a very hot pink purple. This is Aussie Red Gold, which I have an affinity for being an Aussie. <laughs> See how when you add the water to these swatches, it gives you that, um, that nice bloom and cooling and staining and bleaching and all those fun terms. <laughs> I know people would hate that, um, but that's how I use my watercolors, so it, it makes sense that I would try and swatch them out that way. This Mayan Blue Dark is 
Gorgina. Mayan Blue Genuine. It's just lighter than the Mayan Blue Dark. Now we're going into Amethyst Genuine. So you're just painting an amethyst onto your page. I mean, look how incredible that looks. There's some really fun results with that one. This is Rhodonite Genuine. To me, it's like the um, Rose Matter Permanent, but just lighter or transparent. Serpentine Genuine. Serpentine. However you want to say that. That one has a nice like um, golden brown kind of dual pigment kind of separation thing going on in there. So if you watch that as it dries, you'll um, you'll see it pull out. This is Candy Cane Red, which I feel like was maybe a special edition. I think it is. Um, it's it was already a color, but it smells like peppermint. So this is a Christmas favorite. <laughs> Red is also my favorite color. Mars Yellow. All right, here we go with one of the unusual names. I want to say Phthalo, <laughs> but I think I'm just going to say Thalo because it's written for Thalo. It sounds crazy. This is like a bright, bright green or yellow. I'm not quite sure. I'm glad that they called it yellow green because like I said, right in that spectrum where I couldn't tell you the difference. To me, it I think it's green, but I wouldn't bet my life on it. <laughs> This is Bohemian Earth. <laughs> Bohemian. It's a little hard to re-wet, but the color is this like soft, muted, kind of neutral green. I really do like this color. It's unusual for me to like because it, you know, it's not vibrant or punchy or bold. I just, I think it looks so organic. I live in California now, so I'm super organic. <laughs> not really. <laughs> This is iridescent electric blue. I love the iridescence and the duochromes and the interference and the glitter and the pearlescent and the shimmer and the metallic. <laughs> the, uh, the only problem I have with them is that they don't scan. Obviously I can't print in glitter, which is a shame and I hope that technology comes before I die. But for a lot of the things that I'm creating for, um, for, you know, when I make books or I'm doing like challenges and stuff, it's really, really hard to to naturally go for this stuff, knowing that it will never translate. So, I, and unfortunately, I kind of avoid it. I use it in my personal works, like I use it, you know, in my journal or other things that aren't for public consumption in some way or for digitizing. But yeah, a lot of the work I do now is ends up becoming something else and it just becomes too hard because when you're doing that process you want to present it how it was originally intended and you just can't do that you can't print glitter you can sometimes get metallic foiling but then the price of your the price of your project goes up so much that you just think well now it doesn't even make sense to make that anymore <laughs> like i remember i wanted to get gold foiling on one of my books and it took the book price like up double and i thought well at that price no one's buying it <laughs> i'm not even buying it so yeah a little bit expensive. I could just go in and glitter every single book. That might be a fun project for me. Um, Duochrome Oceanic is, I probably should have mentioned that. Lovely, beautiful color, perfect mermaid tail color, I would say. Um, Interference Green is kind of, uh, it does what it says it does. It interferes with another color. You're supposed to, I, I believe you're supposed to mix this and it will give another color a, a green iridescent shift uh, is what I'm led to believe. From what I know that I was told in an art store once, it's what interference colors do. It's like a mixative for another color, but I'll just use it kind of like a top coat, like you would do your nail polish. I would put it over the top of something rather than just mix it in because you know, I don't really need to mix it into something else. Here's the one that I don't want to say out loud, but I think it's red fuch fuchsite. If anyone knows how to say that, like phonetically, can you write it down below? <laughs> I'm curious. This is iridescent bronze. When I swatched this out, I had not, I don't believe I had any of the designs by Rachel Beth watercolors at the time. And, um, and this was, this was amazing to me because I thought, well, this is painting with metal. Like it, it just, it's metallic and I can see it as I'm painting it. It just looks amazing. Um, you can get a really nice thick application where it does look very metallic. But then I used the designs by Rachel Beth Copper Candles. I'm gonna pull it out. I know this is not what this is for, but if you've never been lucky enough to witness how metallic this is, <laughs> you're gonna see it today. Rewet's like a dream, and it's like painting with liquid metal. I'm gonna put it right next to the bronze here. All right, when that dries, you'll see the difference. Or even better, like how different they aren't. As far, because I think a lot of people don't trust handmade watercolors, um, but you know, 
I'm here to vouch for these ones because <laughs> they're just incredible. And copper candles is just, it's just perfect to add on top of something like a fun little pop of metallic. It's great. All right, let's leave that. Uh, that can dry over there and we'll come back to it. Pearlescent shimmer. This, like the, um, like I used the interference green, I use this as like a topper because it's actually just painting with kind of, I, I don't even want to say glitter. It's more like shimmer, like the name says. Glitter to me is very different. That's actually like little mylar particles and I should be able to see it kind of sparkle. This is undersea green. I think I've painted a cat hair in there. <laughs> Why doesn't that surprise me? Never in my life thought I would become that crazy cat lady, but I am. This is Duochrome Autumn Mystery, which I think is a fabulous name for a color. <laughs> like, uh, what was the thought process behind that? Someone just looked at this and thought, oh, that's just an Autumn Mystery. This one is Duochrome Cactus Flower. Now, I um, like the designs by Rachel Beth palette I just pulled out before. Actually, no, it was a different palette. Um, the cupcakes and cocktails, there's a color in there called Manhattan, which I thought this was the same thing. I thought that was kind of like the handmade version of this, much like this iridescent bronze and this copper over here, I feel like are, are very similar. But this actually has, it, it's a purple color, kind of like a very dirty purple, very dirty muted purple, but it has a purple iridescence to it. The Manhattan one actually has a green or gold or maybe both, I don't know, <laughs> um, iridescence to it, a shift. So not the same thing at all. This is Garnet, very deep red brown. It's a beautiful color. I wish I had this in um, like kind of a purple version with this same red. I think it might be nice to mix with a, a, like a deep purple. I saw a flower in San Juan Capistrano that was just like the most intense deep red purple. And I just, I hadn't seen a color like that before in nature. And I, I wanted to see if I could get something similar in a paint or, <laughs> I think I shared it on my Insta story. I was like, does anyone know what this color would be called if I could find it somewhere? Someone said it was like a deep plum. That's exactly what it reminded me of. That's bronzite. I like to mix this with skin. Well, I say I like to, I haven't really done that. I did it once when I was testing it before. I think it's beautiful to mix with um, a skin tone to kind of give it, to give the skin kind of a shimmer. Skin is um, luminous. So it kind of, you know, if you've got healthy skin, it looks like it might be glowing. It's kind of hard to paint glow, but shimmer kind of acts the same way. So putting a little bit of a shimmer into your skin tones, just give them a bit more life. That's Appetite Blue. That's a really, really stunning blue. I'm gonna put some of this water in there. Get that to move a little bit. And this is Appetite Green. It's also a really beautiful color. Do most of you use Daniel Smith watercolors or um, artist grade watercolors? If you do, how was the difference from moving uh, from you know a student grade to, or even a beginner um, quality? Like I know a lot of us use the, um, the Artist Loft or that similar brand. Yeah, the one you can get from Michaels for three dollars and change. A lot of us use that to start out with. Very, very chalky. Just <laughs> basically chalk. Um, but it gets fine. It gets the job done. We learn how to paint. We learn how to pick colors and how to mix. But once you move to this, do you kind of think, well, it's a shame. Uh, my thought process anyway was it's a shame that these are the more expensive and these are what people are most likely to upgrade to last because they're the easiest to use. They give you the best color, the best payoff, the best results. They're easy to re-wet, they're easy to work. Um, you're, you know, if anything, we should be giving our beginners this quality <laughs> of, of paint because it would encourage people to, to, to do it more because you, you find better success with these, I find. Um, I don't know if anyone's story is the opposite. They upgraded and found a difficult time, but uh, leave some of your transition stories down below because I think a lot of people sit on the fence when it comes to trying some of this stuff. And, um, you know, I'm only one person that can tell you how much of a difference it makes. As with everything, you know, there's human skill behind it. You do have to put this stuff into practice. You might encourage someone today, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, so, Amoz Am Amazonite? I want to say Amazonite, but it's clearly an A. Amazonite. Prime Amazonite. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful teal color. Soda light, which has great granulation, is a super interesting color um, that I can't quite determine. This is purpurite, which 
which is like a purple, um, a purple version of the sodalite, I feel. This might be actually the nice, uh, a nice thing to try with that garnet. I'm so tempted to try it almost right now. <laughs> <laughs> Back to that word I don't like again, the uh, fuchsite, fuchsite. This looks like the base of the duochrome oceanic to me. They seem like the same color to me. The duochrome just has the gold shift or green shift. I'm not quite sure what that one is. Either way, it's a nice little shift. Another one of these phthalo turquoise. <laughs> This is a really intense teal color. Ultramarine turquoise. Love that I just said it was a teal color, but it says turquoise. It's turquoise as RuPaul would say. And this is Sleeping Beauty Turquoise. This is from the Sleeping Beauty Mines. That's why it's called Sleeping Beauty Turquoise. There's some rule about um, naming paints or something. Maybe it's an unwritten rule, maybe it's just like a thing that people respect or something, but some pigments come from a certain place or you have to respect the name of the pigment uh, when you're actually naming the paint. Like if it's only made of one certain type of pigment, you have to call it that or something or Maybe if it's a mix, you're not allowed to call it that and something else. I'm not quite sure. There's some interesting rule that I remember hearing and obviously didn't commit to memory. <laughs> but I know it's interesting, so I could try and find that out again. Let's be honest, I'm not going to. But I do know that that pigment that this one is made of is from the Sleeping Beauty mine. I just imagine that Aurora's in there chilling with her Daniel Smith watercolors. <laughs> this is Sugi Light. Suji Light. Suri Cruise Light? I'm not quite sure. Shadow Violet. I like this one too. I don't even know why I bother saying, uh, like, saying I like this one. Like, have I ever gotten to any of them and said I don't like it? <laughs> you should just assume that I do like all of them. Haven't met a Daniel Smith watercolor I don't like. How many people out there does it disturb that I do that? I'm gonna get some thumbs down for when I do that. <laughs> Just dip the water back in. Like I said, I mean, that's that's how I use it. That's what works for me. That's what makes me want to grab these things out and use that specific color or know that that's going to give me the result I want. If you only ate your apples cut up into, or if you only ate your sandwiches cut up into squares, you wouldn't go and prepare them for triangles, right? Just personal preference. This is phthalo blue and this is in the green shade. I think there's also a phthalo blue in another shade. Or, no, there's a phthalo green in a blue shade, which I'm honestly... That's just a little much for me. <laughs> Quinacridone Coral. I love this color. Every time I use a coral, I think of Allie Brown. She's my uh, coral queen. This is pure all orange. I only have one orange in here. I mean, the Aussie red gold kind of looks like a yellow orange. As far as like a true orange, I think I want to try and get the permanent orange. That looks like one I could really enjoy. Because I, I really do like orange as a color, and the one I have is so intense that it's like, <laughs> you know, you don't need that specific orange every time you use an orange. This is Rose of Ultramarine, one of my all-time faves. Again, it's more of that red-purple, and you see that rose color starts to separate as well. I love a good red-purple. I don't know what it is. I like a blue-purple as well, but like, just Rose of Ultramarine really does it. Or is this a blue-purple because it's ultramarine? Not quite sure. Just making stuff up over here. We're gonna get to the end of, end of the video and just say, please disregard everything I had said. <laughs> None of this is based on true facts. Like those, um, like those medicine commercials in the States that get right to the end and tell you every reason you probably shouldn't be using the medicine. <laughs> I think that's, it's legal here, like you you have to do that. It's illegal if you don't list all of those things. But some of them it's like, wow, I mean, I only have a headache. I don't think it's, I'm gonna risk dying for taking a Panadol. <laughs> it's Cobalt Violet Deep. I'll tell you what, Cobalt Blue isn't one of my favorite colors. I don't know what it is. I just, I don't love it. This is Naphthamide Maroon, or as I like to think of it, Burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like burgundy is a word that came about and then disappeared. Like, I don't think anyone past the 90s ever said burgundy again. Or early 2000s. I feel like there was a phase where everyone's um, bridesmaid dress, I remember, um, was burgundy in color. It was a very glamorous color. Very really elegant. <laughs> and the last one, zoisite? Zoisite? I want to say zoisite. Sounds more French. You know I like to speak fake French. That is amazing. This is um, one of the most unexpected colors that I actually really, really love. This is Zwazite, which probably makes sense since I said I really like the Bohemian Green Earth. It's a super earthy, but very rich um, green with a lot of granulation. I actually mix this into a lot of other colors when I want those colors to granulate more. 
because I can always count on this one separating. Um, so this is all of the colors. I want to let it dry a little bit and swatch out a few more and we'll take a closer look at some of these. But you can see here already, I mean the iridescent bronze as opposed to the copper. There's really, I mean, we'll let it dry a little further, but there's no comparison. This is straight up liquid metal. Ooh, I just threw that away and I needed it. <laughs> here we have the three blues that didn't fit into the palette. I might regret that because I'm thinking I might like this color, Smalt. This is Azurite. Oh, I remember, this one is really hard to re-wet. This was uh, one of the newer colors that I've uh, been testing out that I was sent in Happy Mail. Thank you, Rhiannon, again and Lapis Lazuli, which I feel like used to be regarded as a very expensive pigment that didn't only like certain nobility and royals have access to this, or like it was used to make blue garments, which were considered very, very luxurious. I'm not quite sure. I wasn't alive in the Elizabethan times. <laughs> uh, but three very interesting blues. I might be more inclined to use Smalt over the other two. Those are super interesting as well. We'll let them dry down and um, take a closer look, but they won't enter this palette just yet because um, I mean, I guess I could take out interference and shimmer because I don't use them too often But then again, I do like them in there. I don't know creature of habit. You're gonna see some of my neuroses come out today <laughs> um, This is undersea green. We've tried this cascade green I do actually have these three greens um, just popped into the palette here as well, just because I don't want to grab the tube every single time I want to use it. But this is the uh, Cascade Green. It's a really pretty green. I swear I'm painting cat hairs into the paint. <laughs> That's the Amazonite. We've done the Moon Glow, we've done the Payne's Blue Gray and the Kyanite Genuine. So these are the four that aren't in those palettes that I have right here. Um, Although I do have some of those greens, like the, um, I have some of the undersea green, even though it's in this tube here, I still have it over there. I have some more of the Amazonite and some Cascade green, because honestly, until right now, I thought they were all different, but... <laughs> but apparently I had uh, these two already in the half pans, so I'll just use those from the tin first, and then get cracking on those. Okay, I'm going to pop these into the tin here and get rid of that. While these are drying, I'm going to bring this one back and come bring you in for a closer look. Okay, so final thoughts are love everything. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go through and tell you which ones I love the most. Uh, but first of all, let me say the difference between this swatch and this, apart from the extra row of colors, is that this is a, um, they're both cold pressed. This is actually the Canson watercolor paper. Um, and this is the B paper 100% cotton um, it's the professional series B paper company watercolor paper. So um, I'll leave a link to this down below and um, and because this is the one I use today. But all papers aren't created equal and people are going to have different opinions about which paper is the best and which paper um, you know is, is technically going to perform the best for all the different types of things you might want to do as a watercolorist. Can I just encourage you to find what works for you? Um, there are rules out there. You know how I feel about rules. <laughs> um, but there are also, um, there's also workarounds. There's also ways to uh, manipulate things to make them work the way you want to. Um, not everyone's setting out to do the same stuff, so it's not, it doesn't stand to reason that we would all need the same supplies. Um, just because I like using this doesn't mean I don't like using this. And it, you know what I mean? Like I, I pretty much go free for all. And as I like something, I continue to use it. As I don't like something, I let it go. Sometimes I feel like people um, are, are quick to jump to like, oh, there's something wrong with my paint or there's something wrong with me. Sometimes it might even be the paper you're using. So um, just have a check if you have another option to try around and, and just see how different your paints look from paper to paper. Um, particularly, I notice the granulation is a lot easier to pick up in the B paper, the 100% cotton, um, but also some of the colors are a lot more vibrant. Um, on this paper as opposed to this one. And even this Cobalt, Cobalt Violet Deep, I didn't love on this paper because you can see here it kind of looks a little, for lack of a better term, milky. Um, but on this B paper, I love how this looks. I love the granulation of it. It suddenly looks completely different to me and I'm more inclined to use this on the B paper. Now, I don't know, um, you know, maybe when I'm using the uh, Canson, I might try and figure out if I can achieve this effect, but um, you know, don't, 
don't let your first impressions be the only impressions, I guess is, is what I'm telling you. There is, um, there's always another way to give something a go if you feel like you really can make something work. But just notice that there are slight differences in, in how these perform on different papers. But uh, we're not here to talk about paper, we're here to talk about paint. The ones I would recommend you buy if you're looking for um, interesting colors or interesting paints to add to the mix. I'd be looking for interesting uh, dual or triple pigment mixes and I'd also be looking for things like granulation or iridescence or um, metallic shift, uh, metallic shifts like iridescent shifts or um, metallic properties because these are the things you're not really going to find in student grade watercolors. Most student grade watercolors will get you through just fine if you can deal with some of the binders in there because they can be a little bit tricky, um, but I have not had problems using those. I've enjoyed using student grade watercolors before. Um, so I, I would encourage you to probably build more of your set with that. I have the Mungio palette here, which I've actually taken out of the pan as well, but this is a full student grade set. It says it's artist grade. I still don't believe that, but <laughs> uh, you know, I guess you could believe it if you want to believe it. These do not work like metallics at all. They're just kind of terrible. Um, there's been a lot of speculation. You can see in my review for the Mungio, uh, the Ultimate Watercolor Palette review, um, that uh, a lot of companies use this as a manufacturer to private label watercolors for student grade watercolor palettes. I cannot confirm nor deny that. I honestly have no idea. I don't work for any of these companies. Um, but what I can say is that um, I feel like you're truly better off grabbing this palette to satisfy all of your watercolor needs. And then when you want something special, uh, that's when I would look to start investing in um, Daniel Smith colors to fill out your palette with more specific um, mixes or more specific watercolors and then I'd even venture to go into your handmade watercolors uh, for things that are like super specific like this Manhattan color here like I honestly I have never seen anything like this offered in uh, in any other brand um, you know student grade artist grade anywhere it's just it's incredible what some people are able to make from their hands as well so that's where I'd be recommending that you spend your money not so much buying you know your primary colors you can do that as well if you're bowling out of control uh, buy everything Daniel Smith if you can <laughs> um, but I would encourage you to start student grade and then add in your extras and the ones I would add in the ones uh, you know if I had to start all over again I had a limited budget for only the exact ones I would add in um, the things I'd be more inclined to go with is you know first and foremost let's just say copper candles designs by Rachel Beth get that out of the way <laughs> uh, but Daniel Smith we're going with um, my three OGs I have to because it makes the perfect galaxy even though I hate space um, Kyanite Genuine just because you can see the mineral crushed in there and it's like painting stars I just love that. it's like a it's like a not really dark sky with lots of glittery twinkly stars. I don't even know if that made sense, but hopefully. <laughs> um, I'd go with Moon Glow as well because I love the separation of colors in there. Payne's Blue Gray I just think is a great color to use. Um, especially if you've got like just an orange pencil in your Payne's Blue Gray. I think that looks great. Especially an orange pencil with Kyanite Genuine. It's just, it's a beautiful mix. Wisteria. It's a definite for me. Quinacridone Lilac, I think is also a really, really nice color. I can't really go past the Aussie Red Gold and because it's right next to it, Mayan Blue Dark. This to me is like uh, an alternative primary palette. They don't mix well together to like, like Aussie Red Gold and Mayan Blue Dark aren't gonna give you the best green. Um, but the, uh, the, the three colors together, like if you're just looking to go for some bold primaries but don't wanna be typical, this is, um, this is really pretty for me. I love Amethyst Genuine, but I don't think it's necessary. Candy Cane Red is a beautiful red, but it's a bit of a novelty because it smells like peppermint. <laughs> uh, you can see here the iridescence. Um, I, I think that's really pretty. The Duochrome Oceanic, that's really pretty. The uh, red fuchsite, hopefully the interference green is kind of picking up as well. Um, these are all your interesting mixes because you know you don't typically see that in student grade. The pearlescent shimmer, I don't know if you can pick up on that, but it is a slight shimmer. See what I mean? It's not like glitter, but definitely something shimmery there. Undersea green, I haven't uh, had a chance to really use this, but this is a really beautiful um, mix. I would definitely recommend picking that up if, if you're into greens. Bronzite, I can't wait to try uh, with more skin tones because I just think it's really pretty. You can see it's got the uh, the shimmer in there. Garnet looks really beautiful. I um, I don't know if you're a red lover, that might be for you. Appetite Green, super interesting mix. This is this is where you can start to see the um, 
the granulation really go into like full effect. Sodalite's interesting, Purpurite's interesting. Yeah, Sugulite has got a lot more glitter than I expected, like a lot more shimmer. I don't know if I ever really noticed that. Shadow Violet's probably an interesting color to pick up, but I would go Moon Glow or Shadow Violet because they look mostly similar to me. Moon Glow seems more purple than Shadow Violet, even though this name would imply more violet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I would say either or, and I'm more inclined to pick Moon Glow. Quinacridone Coral I would definitely pick up because I think it's a great color to mix for even more variations on coral. Rose of Ultramarine, yes, yes, yes. And funnily enough, these two I, I could not recommend more. I love uh, the Naphthamide Maroon and the Zwasite. So um, those are my picks. If you, uh, if you want to take a little screenshot right there and um, maybe rewind and take a note if you really want to know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how imperative it is for people to truly know which colors I would pick. From these ones here, I do like the Smalt and this Cascade Green is actually super interesting to me. Yeah, as far as my Daniel Smith watercolor collection goes, I'll just get rid of the copper. That's it there. <laughs> That's the, uh, the entire Daniel Smith watercolor collection that I love to play with. And I uh, hope that helped you out. If you're one of those people that, that asked and I never got back to you, I'm super sorry. Hopefully this is uh, coming at the right time and you have a bit of cash to buy your, uh, your half pans now. I will leave a link to an Etsy seller that does sell half pans. Otherwise your best bet is probably to go onto Amazon and uh, I almost said Amazonite. <laughs> to go to Amazon and pick up a tube um, and, and fill your own half pens that way if you want to be super economical about it. Or um, maybe post even in some of your Facebook groups. And I won't mind if you post in the Berkmates Creative Outlet Facebook group and do a, um, a swap or a trade. Uh, I know a lot of people have invested in tubes. Uh, like myself, I have this Payne's Blue Gray that I uh, probably won't get through in a lifetime. So you might be able to find people willing to fill you up a half pan and send it to you if, if you guys live local, if you're in the same country. And that could be a great way to um, expand your collection and to have a look. You might have one, a color that someone else doesn't have. You could just do a bit of a, a trade or a swap. Um, because a lot of these colors, you know, the only ones I bought were these ones right here from Aussie Gold, from Aussie Red Gold to Kyanite Genuine. The rest were gifted to me. And um, I know there's a ton of people out there with extra that they would love to share with you and love to spread the joy of using something like a Daniel Smith watercolor. So I'm going to leave it at that. Hope you enjoyed the video. And until next time, thanks for watching. Bye. Oh, it's more too